Hello. Can you hear me okay? okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk today. And uh, I think Lucia set the scene uh, very, very well with all of the energy uh, supply chain, energy security, and energy independence. And I'd like to focus on what we're doing at Navigator Terminals. We are a UK-only company, so I'll apologize in advance. A lot of my presentations is what we're doing in the UK or how the UK policy is helping Navigator Terminals to transition. But I think you'll see some examples in this presentation that we can all take and, uh, and challenge ourselves as well. So. So a little bit about Navigator Terminals to start with. We are a UK-only company with 1.3 uh, million meter cubed of storage. We have four strategic locations, some two in the northeast, one in London and one in Wales, in the south of Wales. And you'll see a little bit why in the, in the next couple of slides why those locations are quite advantageous due to the cluster development. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and we're owned by two uh, major investment banks, so uh, First Centier Investors, and uh, North Leith Capital, and we also have a 20% shareholder in uh, Greenergy Fuels, which actually offers us quite a unique advantage in the sense that we understand the transition on the road fuels market, whilst part of the business is growing into the new energy carriers as well. Now, I'd like to take a second to introduce Jason Hornsby, our CEO of Navigator Terminals. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, but we have just recently launched a sustainability roadmap, and Jason would like to introduce it to you. The global ecosystem is fragile and the way we manage the environment and the people within it is changing. The outcomes from the Paris Climate Agreement set targets for the world to achieve and Navigator Terminals is meeting the energy transition head on. We are making our contribution to ensuring we achieve those global targets. Hello and welcome to the Navigator Terminal Sustainability website. My name is Jason Hornsby. <laughs> the global ecosystem is fragile and as the CEO of Navigator, I wanted to take this opportunity to provide you with a short introduction to the sustainability roadmap we have set out within our business and our journey through this. All the activities I will briefly describe here can be seen in greater detail on our sustainability website. We are an independent bulk liquid storage provider for biofuel and food waste for conversion to biofuel. We also store bitumen, chemicals, gas and traditional fossil fuels. We have storage capability of close to 1.3 million cubic metres across four UK terminals. In delivering our services, we acknowledge our responsibility to strive for and maintain ethical supply chains. We recognise the opportunities provided by the energy transition and our ambitious diversification and growth strategy underpins the global transition away from fossil fuels. We aim to become the number one provider to the future energy carriers and emissions reduction markets by 2030. We are targeting renewable energy, sustainable fuels and chemicals. As part of the new energy clusters in North East and on the East Coast, we are involved with in looking at energy and fuel solutions, including blue and green hydrogen and ammonia. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you for your help in doing it. <laughs> so I'll just click on to the next one. Ooh. Is that me or you, sorry? I don't think I'll put the video in the next slide, I do. I'm clicking it, sorry. Do you want to try and go to the next slide, sorry?
Is that the next one? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. If that was my side pack, I'm very sorry. So, like I said at the start, we're just a UK company. So a lot of the policy and agenda that's coming out of the UK government right now is obviously very exciting to navigate the terminals. And I thought I'd just highlight three of these uh, policies and save you weeks of reading and thousands of pages. I'll try and get through them in the next couple of slides. What I, what I would like to highlight is that actually the first document, the UK 10-point plan, came out in November 2020. Now, I don't know about you, but that feels like a very long time ago for me. So the 10-point plan was about wind and solar and our potential for hydrogen pneumonia in the UK. More recently, last year, the UK announced the hydrogen strategy. And then more recently, even last month, we announced an energy security strategy. And I think a lot of the points that Lucia uh, brought up will be highlighted uh, excellently in these two documents. So I'll focus a little bit on the last two because I think they're more relevant for the discussion today. And the hydrogen uh, strategy was quite interesting because initially it set a target of five gigawatts of hydrogen production by 2030 in the UK. Now, just to put that into perspective, a world-scale hydrogen plant, blue hydrogen plant, would be around one gigawatt, or less than one gigawatt. We're talking about green hydrogen production of half a gigawatt in Europe right now. So five gigawatts was ambitious at the time. So last year it was quite a target. And if we also look at where we see the projections within this report for the energy mix of around 20 to 35 percent of hydrogen, again, I think your, your, your presentation summed it up quite nicely. At the moment, there's not that market for the hydrogen. It's not there yet. And the projection is quite dramatic. So if you look at consumption, you see here on the left-hand side, there's a mixed, a very broad use of hydrogen in the marketplace. Now, for me, it's quite interesting because where we sit in the UK on the terminals, we sit above the, the natural gas transmission system, we sit on the ports, we sit in the terminals, we sit on the jetties. It's quite interesting to see actually our future customer base may be very different than our current customer base. We'll move into domestic, trans uh, domestic transport for hydrogen, HGVs, domestic heating, so blending of hydrogen into natural gas. We also see a huge potential in fuel switching for industrial applications as well. So actually our new customers, where will these customers be and who will be there in the next five years? And again, the British energy security strategy here. And I would recommend, you know, these documents, they are a little bit challenging to get through, but if you get through to some of the pictograms, they're very interesting because they actually show you and plot the roadmap out. And you'll see that actually after COVID and the post-pandemic, we actually did see a surge in production and we had an energy, almost energy uh, supply chain issue already there. And you'll see kind of ironically on the front of this British energy security strategy, that is not a hydrogen plant. That's a nuclear plant. And it's quite uh, entertaining for me to see that, that conversation back on the market, back on the table now. And for Jason mentioned blue and gray and green hydrogen. There's also now discussions around hydrogen from nuclear energy as well, so pink hydrogen. And I came from the hydrogen industry and I think the sooner we start talking about the colors, the better. But for the, mo for the moment, we'll still continue to talk about colors. And more importantly there at the bottom, the creation of nearly half a million jobs. So these will be new jobs in our market, in our industry. And I think that we have great potential there to lead that. So again, from the hydrogen strategy, you'll see here a roadmap and a policy and a timeline I've highlighted there. Because for me, I stand here now, we sit in the terminal, we have four locations, we have all of the permitting, all of the coma registrations, we have tens of acres of development land, we have thousands of trucks going in and out of the terminals every day, and I'm still worried about timeline. And I think that that's a message that um, I struggle or we struggle, or the, the TSA, or the, the UK equivalent of FETSA and VOTOB, we're constantly onto the government, onto try to drive investment and policy to give our investors the confidence to invest in the projects. So I believe there's fantastic potential in hydrogen, ammonia, and methanol. And I also believe the customer base is there already. But I think we need those pricing mechanisms and we need the confidence to invest in those projects. You won't be surprised on, on this roadmap where I see quite a lot of potential for navigator terminals and our competitors across Europe. Most of the problems we see in the energy transition, energy stability and energy security and supply chain exist within our terminal operations. So I believe we can offer a fantastic solution to that. So again, this is a bit more detail on the, on the UK cluster development map and I only highlight it because, I don't know if this will work, is that, I won't bother pressing it in case I ruin the presentation, but we're actually on the far end of that conversation there. So this is a highlight of policy that's come out in the past and policy that's intended to come out in the future. And what I would say is that in 2022 was a very, very busy year for projects to be submitted for government funding to understand what the cost for difference mechanism would be, the hydrogen pricing policy, hydrogen economy. But we are just at the start of this, of this uh, roadmap. And we expect in the summer, there'll be some announcements on which project was successful. 
And I, I kind of sympathise with the projects, Navigator supporting maybe 12 or 30 of the projects across the UK, and I sympathise with them because last year, last summer, they were doing two years' worth of design work, finishing their applications, and last month the UK has almost doubled their hydrogen demand production. So the, the, the project development phase was phenomenal last year, and we've only just started. And so the next couple of years will be... Hopefully, we'll see some clarity on those pricing mechanisms, clarity on the projects which will be successful. And the reason why I highlighted this now is because you see some stars there on the, on the far side there where the now, last month, announced 10 gigawatts. So it was five last year, now it's 10. And this is still by 2030. So there's a session here at the end. I think I missed a couple of slides on the cluster that was at the top where I talked about CO2, but I can go back to it in a minute. This is where I say about collaborating for growth because I don't believe that Navigator Terminals will do it all on our own in the next five years. I think we will form strategic partnerships and collaborate. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of the projects that are developing around the clusters, and I'll skip back to that slide in a moment, sorry. The reason why they're collaborating around the clusters is because it offer, offers the UK quite a unique opportunity to develop four or five huge carbon capture clusters. And on the back of those carbon capture clusters, you can develop a blue hydrogen plant or a gathering network for CO2. And Navigator is offering an opportunity there to, to the government, to the UK government and to the UK market for CO2 shipping. So we have an illustration there on the corner, and, and I'm not one for 3D images, so I apologize. I don't, I don't particularly, I prefer my uh, PNIDs and line diagrams, but the 3D image there shows a, a 50,000 ton CO2 import facility, so multimodal. And so that's rail, road, ship. So that's CO2 conditioning and purification for transport by ship or by road or by rail. And the reason why I say multimodal is because, as you well know, in, in the terminal industry, we're dealing with quite a, a fuels, blending, changing specifications in fuels, and CO2 is just the same. So if you are, happen to be located near a CO2 pipeline, you will have a very, very tight specification on the CO2 to go into that pipeline. If you want to ship CO2, that will be at a different pressure, different water content, different purification. If you produce CO2 at the back of a net zero power plant, that will be a very different CO2 specification. If you have very small waste to energy plants, they will be another set of conditions. So for us, I see us kind of in my mind of the big players are developing huge motorways and highways for high pressure, high purity CO2 and navigator terminals, much like we do in the fuels and chemicals market, are supplying that route to CO2 capture for everyone else. And I think that again, I'm, I'm quite excited about this opportunity within the business, but this is just at the start of the conversation and, and we welcome discussions and, 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 and uh, conversation from everybody because I don't think that we can do this on our own and I think that we have a great idea with the terminal and the hub, but I think it can be replicated across Europe as well, and I would encourage that discussion to be had for CO2 shipping. So I'll just, sorry, I'll skip back because I think the video actually missed a slide. Uh, this was the slide, sorry. So the cluster development, the reason why I call it the CO2 backbone is because you'll see here in the UK, we already have it huge industrial clusters already. So these are heritage clusters. This is from previous industrial uh, complexes or refinery applications. So we have on Teesside there where we're located, Southampton just on the, on, the, on, the, on the south coast, south of Wales. Grangemouth is a huge industrial complex. I apologize if this is all old news to you. And the Humber there alone, 12 million tons of CO2. That's a huge amount of CO2 in one very, very small location. So I think that we have, again, opportunity around these clusters to use them to create the new industry. These are already, I mean, I live in Teesside myself. There's not many places in the UK you could develop these huge industrial clusters where people would welcome them. And I think we have, again, we can reinvent these industrial clusters. I think that that was, sorry, I should have done that slide before. So again, my closing remarks, sorry. Again, to highlight what Lucia said, this is not just now about an energy transition. So when I joined Navigator a year ago, it was a drive from our investors to create a more sustainable business, to be involved in these new energy markets. How do we play in ammonia, carbon capture, hydrogen? Now I think it's not just a, a nice discussion and some nice concepts to be talked about. Now it's a serious investable opportunity. And that's really where we've come a long way, only in the last six months to a year. And the last couple of months has changed everything for us. The ESG uh, credentials, you won't be surprised that our investors are driving that from every decision we make, whether that's buying steel for new tanks or whether that's building new terminals or whether that's choosing the customers that we collaborate with. So that's really important that, that and you won't be surprised, there'll be a presentation on that later on today that I've looked forward to as well. And hydrogen has great potential. And I say only as part of a syngas family because I came from the syngas market where we would never really talk about hydrogen on its own. So we would always associate hydrogen, particularly blue now in this scenario, associated with ammonia or methanol or CO2. And I think that, there, again, there's great potential in that broader syngas family rather than just focusing on, on hydrogen. And again, I think it's really important that we try to attract new and diverse talent into this industry. 
I came to the terminal industry, I was not from the terminal industry, and I am really, this last year, I've been really excited. You know, FEDSA and VOTOB and the TSA committees that we've joined for energy transition, I think there's fantastic potential in this industry and fantastic uh, careers. And the solutions in the energy transition could be in this room, right? We could start the discussion now, we could have the discussion with the policymakers, we could speak to IHS with the market, the market analytics, and we can work those solutions right now. I think we have the ideas, but we must collaborate to accelerate that growth. And I think the collaboration comes from government policy as well and guiding that as well. But anyway, I'd like to thank you for your time and apologize for the error in the slide, but I'm happy to discuss later on. Thank you.